Okay, Jonathan, just give me the signal, Jonathan. Just tell me when I can start. Thank you. Okay, I'm Harris Lewin. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research, and uh, let me just uh, apologize to those of you in the room here yesterday heard my introduction. Uh, I don't have any more creative things to say about uh, Professor DeLong uh, today than I did yesterday, so I'm going to repeat much of what I said, and I hope you don't mind that. Uh, I am very pleased to introduce my, my friend and colleague, uh, Ed DeLong, who is the Morton and Claire Goulda Professor in the Departments of Civil Engineering and Biological Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Ed, as you know, is here as uh, the store lecturer and also today we'll be receiving the uh, Outstanding Alumnus Award in the College uh, of Biological Sciences. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, Storer Lectureship, the Tracy and Ruth Storer Lectureship in the Life Sciences is the most prestigious of the endowed seminars at UC Davis. Established in 1960, the lectureship is made available through a gift from Professor Tracy I. Storer and Dr. Ruth Riston Storer for the purpose of bringing eminent biologists from other institutions to participate in the academic community of the Davis campus. Dr. DeLong received his Bachelor of Science degree in bacteriology from UC Davis in uh, 1982. And uh, Ed assures me that uh, 30 years ago when we were both on the campus, he was not the person I ran over the first day I was here as a PhD student on my way to classes. Uh, on, on my bicycle. So we overlapped, uh, but we didn't know each other then, but we, we do now. <laughs> uh, uh, Ed went on to do a PhD in marine biology at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in the laboratory of the esteemed marine biologist Aristides Yainos, where he did his pioneering work on the functional and evolutionary characterization of deep sea microbes. Ed did postdoctoral research at Indiana University was briefly a member of the, actually, UC faculty at UC Santa Barbara in marine biology, and then moved on to be a scientist and rose to the rank of senior scientist at the Monterey Bay Research, um, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. In 2004, Dr. DeLong moved to MIT, where he's developed one of the world's leading pro research programs in marine microbial ecology. Uh, Ed has many mo uh, honors among them, the Moore Investigator in Marine Microbiology, the Procter & Gamble Award in Applied and Environmental Microbiology, election as a fellow in the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and as a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. He has served as a member of the DOE Joint Genome Institute Policy Board and the Scientific Advisory Committee. He served as editor of Environmental Bi Microbiology and as a member of the editorial uh, of the reviewing board of editors for Science magazine. And he's also served as director of research for the National Science, and Fo National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center for Microbial Oceanography. And uh, my personal favorite, uh, which tells you a lot about who Dr. DeLong really is, he serves on the MIT Steering Committee for the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values. And I think Ed uh, really has uh, uh, the qualities that are, are, are unique in that he is not only brilliant as a scientist, but he also shows outstanding human qualities, kindness, compassion, and thoughtfulness. Dr. DeLong is truly an explorer, in the, really in the true sense of the word. If you look at the voyages he's had to many corners of the Earth, the Antarctic, for example. He spanned the globe, really, in search of clues uh, to the origins and, fa and fate of biogeochemical cycles in the Earth's oceans. And he's best known internationally for his discovery of the bacterial use of rhodopsin in converting sunlight to biochemical energy in marine microbial communities. And this research, as many of you know, made famous in the paper in Science, um, revealed a previously unknown component of the Earth's carbon and energy cycles. His work spans genomes to biomes and the evolution of microbes to the evolution of our planet. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Ed DeLong, who will deliver today's lecture entitled Microbial Community Genomics and Transcriptomics Reveal Structure, Function, and Dynamics of Marine Planktonic Phages. Ed? <laughs> 
Well, um, thanks very much. It's really a great honor to be here, um, to see really some dear old friends and make new ones and come back to my alma mater uh, um, uh, just to say thanks. Uh, and in particular, uh, my undergraduate mentor is here, which means a very lot to me, uh, Paul Bauman, who really got me started in science by letting me into his lab uh, as an undergraduate here at UC Davis. Um, it can really make a big difference, places like Davis and, and research experiences like that. So thank you. Well, what I'd like to talk about today um, are really some advances in how we can visualize, if you will, and understand structure and function in complex microbial communities out in the environment. And that's a, that's a tall order. That's a tall order because um, these communities are not easy to, to, to control or study necessarily in the laboratory in the same way they operate out in the field. It's important to do both. We need model systems in the laboratory to really understand the finer details, biochemistry, physiology, genetics. But we also need to be able to understand how assemblage of microorganisms operate uh, out in the natural world. And so that's where we've thrown a lot of our effort over the years. So I'll be speaking about that uh, with a couple examples of some of the things that we've done, uh, looking at the gene content in microbial communities, when and where those genes are actually expressed that tells us something about the dynamics of those microbes out in the environment, uh, and, uh, and looking at really um, uh, how we can use that information to make inferences about the kinetics of response uh, and how microorganisms interface with their complex uh, uh, um, interactions in the environment. But I'm going to start out with uh, an introduction just to, to, to get us all on the same page. It's a little bit of uh, overlap from yesterday. For those of you who were there then, I apologize, but I want to make sure we get everybody up to speed. Now, one of the big advances in terms of understanding microbes and their interrelationships was the development of phylogenetic techniques, the ability to make, if you will, gene family trees uh, such that one could relate all the domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, kind of in the same context. So what the branch links in these trees really tell you is the evolutionary distance uh, between extant or modern day lineages um, that all came from a common ancestor. So that's an interesting way to think about the evolutionary relationships of all cellular life on Earth, and it was a big advance, uh, really, uh, by Carl Woese and others in the uh, 1980s. Uh, now, Norm Pace was able to take that a bit further. He realized if we can make maps of microbes, uh, family trees, if you will, from these genes, then we can reach into any habitat we want for those same genes and put them on that map so we can understand what lives out in these natural microbial communities. And the logic flow is simply that we can reach into a natural microbial population, just biomass in the environment, extract nucleic acids, and look for those uh, taxonomically or phylogenetically informative macromolecules like ribosomal RNAs. You can, in various ways, this is a, an old slide, but the logic is the same, get those genes, sequence them, and then put them on this map to relate them to known and well-characterized organisms. So now we can start to characterize microbes out in natural habitats without necessarily having the requirement to grow them, and, and we don't have to do it one at a time either. We can reach into that whole population and, and figure out who's there in relationship to who we know about by putting them on these phylogenetic trees. Now, I'm going to mostly talk about the ocean, but I thought that I would tell you about how these approaches developed by PACE are really kind of advancing our knowledge in things that maybe some of us care more about, like the ecosystems we carry around with us, the human microbiome. So there's been a series of recent papers that have basically utilized these techniques to map the kinds of microbes that live in and on us. And it's really interesting what we're learning in terms of the variability between communities, between an individual and another individual, and between populations that live in different parts of the world, and in how diet may affect the kinds of microbes that we carry along with us and their function, how they affect us. And so it, this is an example from a recent paper by the Human Microbiome Consortium, and the, this is just focus on this top panel right here. And what we're looking at are the colors really code different microbial taxa. 
Each of these, this represents about 256 individuals that were sampled in these various body um, uh, parts for what kinds of microbes are there. And I, I'm not going to get into names and details, but what you can see is that each of these individuals has a different ratio of the green versus the red or the yellow types of phyla of microorganisms, if you will. So there's variability within phyla in a given body habitat, if you will, as you can see here. And between these body habitats, say the nose and the cheek, inner cheek, there's also differences between the major phyla that are there, and they vary between individuals. And the same with teeth and tongue and so on. So the development of these techniques by Pace and others, uh, his students, is allowing us to really map the sorts of microbes, their variability. Now this is all in healthy individuals. And so we can begin to ask the questions of how that variability uh, uh, correlates between particular disease states and healthy individuals. So, so that's one ad advance. We can also begin to understand the ecology of these microbes and how that maps onto the population biology and habits, if you will, of humans. And, and this is another recent study um, by Jeff Gordon, who has really pioneered uh, the human microbiome project's uh, 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 beginning, if you will. And what he did was to look at individuals from three different populations on, on our planet. Uh, one from the U.S., so individuals in the U.S. were sampled for their gut microbiomes. Uh, a, a population in South Africa, a small native population, and another small native population in Venezuela in the Amazonas of about 100 individuals. Now, he looked across many different age classes of people at those microbiomes, uh, uh, as well as, as looking at the kinds of packs that were there. And what we're looking at here is basically a plot of, of young uh, 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 individuals from these three different populations kind of color-coded, uh, and how their microbiomes vary uh, when compared to adults. So we're really looking at the difference between young children and the microbiomes in their guts uh, between the adult <coughs> microbiome. And what you can see when that's done is that there's a real, um, this is uh, uh, the dissimilarity, so this is very different microbiome in these newborns between that found in adults. But over the course of a couple of years, what you'll see is that that drops and drops and you get more and more similar microbiota between young children and adults, such that by the year of about three years of age, you basically have a fully developed gut microbiota. And that gut microbiota development is similar whether you're in South Africa or uh, South America or in the US. So that's pretty interesting. <coughs> Um, however, the composition of this gut microbiota varies with respect to who's there. And if you do a, a principal components analysis, what's interesting is that the U.S., uh, if you will, microbiome uh, clusters together relative to the microbiome from both South Africa and South America, which also cluster together. So that's interesting. I mean, these, these African populations and South American populations are really quite different in many cultures and customs and so on. And yet there's a clustering here, and we'll get to that in a little bit about why that may be. But what it says is that there's variability uh, between populations for whatever reasons, but also that the development of the microbiome uh, is, is basically uh, happening along with the development of the child, and what the interrelationship of those is is really interesting and a very active area of research right now. That kind of um, dynamic really couldn't have been looked at until these sorts of techniques were developed. Um, interestingly, if you take a look at total diversity, so this is basically the total number of taxa, uh, in the U.S. there's uh, uh, um, quite a bit fewer uh, species, if you will, than were found in both the South African as well as the South American uh, populations. Uh, and this is the development of those taxa over time in young children from years one, two, three, and so on, age groups. And so you see this um, basically leveling off once the tax is developed after age uh, of three or so. Uh, and you can see that here in a blow up of how that community is developing in all three of these different populations uh, over the course of three years. 
So the development of the microbiome uh, and at some level is, is, is following the development of children at a young age, and that has important implications for phenotype. So that's just an introduction of how some of these cultivation uh, independent approaches are, are really advancing ways that we can understand very complex ecosystems, including the ones that we carry uh, with our own body. Um, what that doesn't tell you, that's simply a taxonomic uh, overview of the sorts of microorganisms that are there, and it doesn't tell us exactly what those organisms are doing or how they're functioning. And so part of uh, what I'll be speaking about today are some of our efforts in the ocean for t going beyond just a uh, census, if you will, of what sorts of organisms are there, to what they're doing, how they're doing it, and when they're doing it. Uh, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, that's what this is meant to illustrate. We know that there are lots of these different taxa now, uh, but what we really want to know is what's their gene content, what's the function, and how do variations in taxa correlate to variations in functionality. Um, another way I like to look at this um, is, is the sorts of mapping that folks are trying to do now using these sorts of omic technologies and applying them and looking at microbial communities. And so there's, a, there's an intersection really between just doing gene surveys, if you will, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, and overlaying those on the current kind of organism surveys, if you will, of the sorts of organisms that are there, and their phenotypes and physiology and so on. And then trying to understand those sorts of uh, uh, biological hierarchies in the context of the communities and the environments in which they live. And one of the, the kind of advantages of metagenomic approaches is that they intersect at some level between these different kind of overlapping uh, uh, um, organizational levels of biological systems. Now this may be for one instant in time or a particular place, if you will, if you're trying to overlay these properties, but at the same time you can't rule out time. So if you imagine that this is a plane in the third dimension, uh, uh, evolutionary processes and differentiation and mutation and selection, of course, are happening, so there's, a, there's another dimension uh, that needs to be explored in trying to map what's going on in these microbial communities. Our first real for foray in terms of trying to map function and microbes onto the environment uh, was looking at profiles of microbes in the Central Pacific Ocean. Uh, and so what we did was develop methods, and this was before a lot of the recent advances in DNA sequencing technology, so this is using somewhat more old-fashioned technologies, but what we were able to do was to create libraries, clone libraries of genomic microbial DNA through the water column all the way to four kilometers of depth in the central Pacific Ocean. We did this as a test in a way because we knew, for instance, that photosynthetic organisms should reside up at the surface. So there are particular gene distributions that we expected to see, somewhat of a built-in control. But of course, there are lots of gene distributions we knew nothing about, uh, which is what we were trying to learn uh, at this uh, site, which is about 100 kilometers north of Hawaii. The other reason we chose this uh, site is because of uh, a dear collaborator of mine, Dave Carl, has been working out at this site for over 27 years. Ships have been going out at the Hawaii Ocean Time Series site and taking all kinds of physical, chemical, biological measurements in a time series so that the environmental context in which these microbes live is really well defined, um, which is really important in considering these sorts of studies. Now, I don't want to get into too many of the details of, of, of the results from that study, but what I will tell you is that um, as a first test, many of our expectations of what we might see were met. And so what we're looking at here in these heat maps is basically in these columns that represents different gene categories uh, uh, at various different depths from 10, 70, 130 meters to 500, 770, 4,000. This green here represents the fact that these three depths down to 130 meters are still in the photic zone. There's plenty of light left for photosynthesis out in the central ocean, at least all the way down to 130 meters or so. And then we get into the aphotic zone deeper. And one of the things I'll point out is that if we look at these functional categories of genes, uh, the, the many different genes that are associated with photosynthesis, um, their pattern is shown here, as well as the chlorophyll biosynthetic genes, the pigments necessary for photosynthesis, 
And what I hope you can see here is that these are distributed very well up near the surface in the photic zone and pretty much disappear at that. So a little bit of a, uh, a sanity check on do the distributions of genes we see map our expectations in we, what we know the organismal distributions are. So that was a, a, a reasonable first test, but of course we were interested in gene distributions um, that showed patterns we, we, we hadn't expected or predicted. Um, and that's shown here in this plot. And just to blow this up, one really curious thing we saw was uh, a high presence of these aldolases right here, uh, which um, we were hard pressed to explain initially. And, and the reason I point out this example is that um, oftentimes those gene distributions are going to give you taxonomic information. And in this case, it was taxonomic information that we couldn't get from ribosomal RNAs because it turns out these particular transaldolases are from phage, um, cyanophage in particular. And so what, based on, on these data, you know, it gave us a clue that in this particular sample, for reasons I'll get into in a second, there were really high abundance of phage in the cellular fraction that we were collecting on filters, which is, is, was un, unexpected for us. Another unexpected trend, which we really didn't necessarily expect to see at all, is a particular class of genes that basically tracked uh, almost monotomically an increase as a function of depth. And those were uh, transposases, basically, jumping genes, if you will. Now, there was no reason to predict a priori that we should see a steady increase in transposable elements and transposases as a function of depth. But this has subsequently been verified in a couple different places in the ocean using a variety of different techniques. Um, we can talk about the, why this might be later. I don't have enough time to get into the details, but what I'd like to point out is that environmental selective pressures appear to be affecting many different classes of these transposases. There are about 70 different classes here in many different sorts of taxa. So this is not a taxon-specific distribution. This seems to be reflective of the kind of selection pressure, actually we think relaxed selection, against transposases as a function of depth because of the environmental conditions. Um, and it's just meant as an example to show that we can learn things that we might not predict that particular classes of genes are tracking specific environmental gradients that we might not have guessed um, previously. Um, going back to the phage, remember I said we found that transaldolase gene that looked like it came from a cyanophage. Well, if we map all the gene identifications we could make in these profiles, it turns out that 10% of the genes at that 70 meter depth came from cyanophages. And our best uh, uh, guess is, is that we just happened to sample at that point in space and time a population of Prochlorococcus, the most abundant cyanobacteria, that was basically infected and about to undergo a burst uh, at that time. And the, I won't give you any reasons. We don't know the reasons why that was at that particular place and time. But what I will point out is that this sort of approach has potential to give you information on organism-organism or phage-organism interactions because you sample the whole milieu at the same time. So uh, uh, host-predator interactions can be captured using these sorts of approaches. So kind of higher order biological interactions that are captured at the informational level in nucleic acids. So these sorts of um, uh, initial glimpses that, that this sort of approach can, even just looking at gene distributions, give you this kind of information, I think encouraged us and others that, that maybe this is a viable approach to take. And so, you know, we might not all care about the ocean, so let's get back into the human microbiome. There's a really lovely paper that I talked about previously by Jeff Gordon comparing the U.S., Malawian, and America, uh, sorry, the, the Venezuelan uh, populations, um, similar kinds of heat maps, looking at similar gene distributions between these different populations, and all kinds of actually pretty interesting and probably significant correlations between functional gene distributions, between age groups, and between these different population groups are popping out of this. One, for instance, is that the baby gut microbiomes in all three populations were enriched in certain types of vitamin biosynthesis uh, compared to adults. And conversely, over those three years as the gut microbiome matures, 
the adult gut microbiome becomes enriched in vitamin B12, B7, B1 biosynthesis. Um, and this has a lot to do probably with the, the vitamins that babies get in mother's milk uh, versus not and so on. Um, it turns out that uh, uh, if you take a look, the baby gut microbiomes, the organisms uh, packing these genes, that have genes that are enriched uh, for degrading glycans that are found in breast milk. Uh, and then they diminish over time, and in fact, these are enriched in the uh, Malawian and uh, Venezuelan populations relative um, to the American populations, and so on. And there's a list, and I don't want to go through the list, but what I want to uh, uh, point out is, is that these taxon distribution and the gene distributions overlaid on them as they change over time or as they vary between different populations or age groups are giving us real insight. And it turns out that some of the differences that are being seen seem to be really related to diet. So that the big differences that we see in taxa between the U.S. populations and these other native populations, as well as in functional genes, can be directly traced um, to differences in diet. Um, so, so some of these patterns with respect to microbial communities that live within us and also help us digest our um, diet are, are starting to become known. So there's good reason to think, I think, that these sorts of approaches can give us um, wonderful information about the dynamics of uh, host microbiome interactions and their functional consequences. So we're pretty excited about that and to see where it's going because it, we think it's going to take an understanding of microbial communities um, to a new level. So one of the things about these surveys, though, is, you know, they are pretty much taking a census, and a census that's really at a, a static point in space and time. Uh, when you do comparisons of large numbers of individuals, like Jeff Gordon, you can get a lot more information. Um, but what we really were interested in is trying to get more of a motion picture of how microbes and microbial communities were responding to their environment. And what's recently become possible is that it's possible to do what's now called RNA-seq uh, or, or transcriptomics. We called it metatranscriptomics for looking at microbial communities to look at not just the gene distributions, the potential, but when and where those genes are being expressed uh, over the course of time and space in these microbial communities. So we started to develop techniques like this so we could basically look within these time domains that we don't often sample out in the environment. And I, I show this graph just to make the point that um, we have many challenges trying to study microbes out in their natural habitats. They live on uh, spatial scales and respond to the environment on temporal scales that are incredibly challenging to try and sample. Uh, and so while the development of these techniques is really exciting because it gives us a new microscope into the microbial world, uh, we still have challenges of how we can adequately sample in both time and space and to ask the question, what's the appropriate scale that we should be looking at? And that's a little bit part of our motivator for trying to develop some of these gene expression techniques to look at microbial communities. In the ocean water column, at some level, we have an easier job because microbial populations are, are really distributed as near as we can tell where we sample on the order of meters or tens of meters. It's the same size scale as us, so it's a little bit more feasible to be able to try and sample the same population or similar populations over time. And again, the notion is, is that the, uh, the, the instructions for what to do and when to do it are encoded in these informational macromolecules. And because we can now access those with new technologies, we can begin to use that, that, that biological information, uh, uh, if you will, to start to understand ecological processes like community succession, function, uh, responses and adaptation, and, and how they translate into larger ecosystem processes. So to develop these techniques, what we did was to extend from uh, beyond just looking at community DNA and shotgun sequencing that to look at genes or to look at taxa, uh, as, but at the same time extract total RNA from a community and using a variety of techniques that we borrowed from the eukaryotic community, uh, generate cDNA from very small amounts of RNA 
um, to uh, look at what genes were being expressed uh, from the genes that were contained in that community. Um, we could do this uh, with the techniques that we developed in about a liter of seawater, so that meant we could sample quickly and also we can uh, uh, um, process many samples. So this is just uh, uh, one of our first experiments, and I don't want to dwell on it too long, but what we're looking at here are the overlapping gene sets that we found both in the DNA and the cDNA, the expressed genes in the RNA, and what the ratios of the cDNA to the DNA was. So highly expressed genes over here in these ratios and, on, and ones that were uh, uh, less, less so highly expressed down here. And then we looked at the sorts of um, gene IDs that we found within those expressed DNAs in these different kind of expression levels. And the bottom line is, is at least based on what taxa were there, the sorts of genes we found made, made sense. This is kind of just looking at all the genes, but probably a more useful way to think about this is if you have a reference genome from highly abundant organisms in the environment, you can begin to map those expressed genes uh, as well as the, the DNA that you find onto a reference. And that's what this plot shows you with Prochlorococcus, one of the most abundant cyanophage in the ocean that's, that's uh, splitting water using sunlight and fixing CO2. It's a primary producer. And so the coverage uh, across the genome is pretty good. Uh, and what you see is that many of these genes are being expressed as well, and it's not as tight a distribution. Usually these are single copy genes, so you get one gene per, per cell, and there's X number of cells, and so you get this number, if you will, of, uh, 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 of representation across the genome. But different genes are being expressed at different levels, and so you get a little bit more scatter of gene expression across the genome. The reason for showing this plot and the reason that we did it in the first place is we really wanted to get a good idea of um, how feasible this was and what it was telling us about individual populations like Prochlorococcus out in the environment, how good our coverage was across the genome. <coughs> what you can imagine is, this is just one sample from 75 meters, is that you could compare many different depths, not only with respect to the gene content, but also with respect to this gene expression. And um, if we did those sorts of plots, looking at these expression ratios uh, across a, another profile through uh, the water column down to 500 meters, um, here's what we saw. And, and the reason I show this is because when we began this, um, you know, we're just reaching into uh, uh, the environment and wild microbes, if you will, and trying to look at what genes are being expressed, but it's very complicated. We're reliant on existing databases to identify genes. We don't really have good controls. We're just reaching into nature and seeing what we get. And so we wanted to be somewhat careful about what we were looking at. And one thing that alarmed us quite a bit was this, the highest expression levels that we saw uh, were things that were hypothetical, nothing in the databases that we could identify, or when we looked into it, actually miscalled protein genes. That is, something in the database that was called a protein that when you look further into it really wasn't. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. So we had to sort this out. Uh, when we got down to these expression levels, we were pretty confident we were looking at expressed protein genes. Well, what was, what was these mystery hypotheticals that we ran into? And we really wanted to dig into that uh, because they represent a pretty large proportion of what we saw. These are just four different samples at four different depths. Uh, um, and what we're looking at here, these are the ribosomal RNA genes, which are going to be in all of these samples. They represent a large proportion of cellular RNA. Um, these are protein coding genes, the, the genes we're after to look at protein gene expression. But then there's these big gaps, and we had to look into that mystery of what some of these really highly expressed RNAs were that we couldn't really prove were proteins, or, or that is the, the uh, uh, mRNAs coming from uh, coding for proteins. And so what, what are these things is the question. And what do they represent? Because we wanted to start to use this as a tool, and if we couldn't figure out what we were looking at, it might have been somewhat difficult. Well, the clues as to what they were came when we took those mystery RNAs and laid them up against DNA fragments, either from the environment or from reference genomes. And they showed a pattern that would, we wouldn't have predicted necessarily. What we found were that these clusters of hypothetical genes, if you will, were piling up on top of one another, 
and not just in random places in the genome, but in intergenic regions. And this was a big clue because intergenic RNAs, it turns out, are becoming more and more recognized as really important regulatory ele uh, elements, both in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And if we looked at the idea of some of these, there, some of them we might have predicted, functional RNAs. RNAs P RNA, for instance, is an RNA processing ribozyme. So some RNAs are actually catalytic, and they can perform uh, uh, catalytic functions just like proteins do. So some of these RNAs we found, actually uh, some of them were misannotated as proteins, but we could kind of check those off, okay, we know what those are. Um, many of the others represented uh, some of these what are called uh, small RNAs, which are involved in regulation, both at the level of transcription and translation, uh, uh, m mRNA and, and protein synthesis. Um, so we began to see how many of these kind of mystery RNAs we could map to known either functional or regulatory small RNAs. Uh, and we did that. There's, a, there's some nice databases out there that allow you from secondary structural predictions uh, and hidden Markov models and known functional regulatory RNAs to, to identify them. And so we went through those small RNAs. What we found was that about 16 percent of our mystery RNAs we couldn't identify mapped into some of these known groups. For instance, some of these functional uh, catalytic RNAs like ribosomal R uh, RNAs P, um, but also some things that are called riboswitches, which are involved in regulation. And they actually can bind other small molecules and uh, uh, turn on or turn off either the transcription or the translation of different proteins. So this is interesting, and we were getting closer to identifying the mystery RNAs, but we only accounted for 16 percent of them when comparing them to known small RNAs that are in our databases. So we had to dig a little further uh, and actually develop um, some criteria to figure out how to identify these RNAs here. Here's the known RNAs that we could find in databases in the RFAM database. And it's only a small sliver of these unknown ones. And so uh, what we did was develop some criteria to uh, categorize these RNAs to give evidence that they're actually functional or regulatory small RNAs. And the first, uh, uh, what we did was to cluster all those small, small RNAs based on similarity. Uh, and by clustering those, uh, we could uh, find particular groups. And in this case, looking at the samples we had, we had about, about 65 different RNA clusters. Um, and then what we could do is see if they mapped to any DNA uh, uh, elements. And uh, most of those clusters of very similar mystery RNAs indeed did map to intergenic regions on one or another metagenomic DNA fragment. So check, that looks pretty interesting. They mapped to, most of them mapped to intergenic regions. Uh, supporting somewhat that these might be small RNAs, even though they're not in any database and we don't know their function yet. Criteria two is that they form predicted secondary structures that are present in these regulatory RNAs. How these RNAs work and how catalytic RNAs work is not from the primary sequence, but it's from the secondary structure. And the secondary structures form the uh, 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 catalytic or regulatory uh, elements that allow these things to, to bind small molecules uh, and to interact in, in ways that regulate uh, gene expression or protein translation. And what we found in many of these uh, putative small RNA groups that mapped on intergenic regions is that they did indeed have predicted uh, uh, complementary base pairing that form predicted stem loop structures that are known to be involved in these sorts of processes, uh, for instance, binding of small molecules. So criteria two, so mapping intergenic regions, forming predicted secondary structures. And then um, our reviewers, uh, rightly so, even with those two criteria, um, objected uh, in the sense that how can you rule out that these are not small <laughs> RNAs that are coding for peptides? Uh, and there is a way to rule that out, and that is Proteins have wobble at the uh, third codon, and so there are predictable patterns when you have alignments of similar sequences. And what's interesting about this is in these samples, we were pre-provided with alignments. Remember, we clustered these similar small RNA sequences. So we already had alignments, and what we could do 
is use uh, a Fourier transform analysis to look for patterns at every third base. And if these were protein coding, we should see a huge signal. And I'll give you an example of that. What we have in here is a control, which is a known uh, protein ammonia monooxygenase subunit. And that's uh, in red here. And so you do this Fourier transform analysis. And when you get to 0.33 in this Fourier transform, that is every third base, you get a huge pattern signal. That's just the third codon um, bias that you expect to see in terms of changes. Um, if you look at all these small RNA categories and clusters we had, it's just kind of noisy all over the map and we don't see this, this expected um, uh, coding potential that you would see in this pattern of, that would happen every three bases. So given the fact that we could rule out that they're pro small peptides or proteins, they clustered to intergenic regions, uh, and have predicted uh, secondary structures that could function in regulation. Uh, we still call these PSRNAs, putative small RNAs, but all the evidence points to the fact that they're like the small RNAs that we see in characterized systems. And I know you can't read this, so I apologize, but we, what we could do then is take those categories of, of uh, small RNAs and look at their distribution across depth. So some of these small RNAs were found at all depths. Some of them were specific, and it turns out they're specific to very particular taxa. And we could look at flanking genes on either side um, to try and get some idea of whether maybe um, they were involved in upstream uh, uh, regulation and that sort of thing. Uh, and I, I can't get into this, obviously, the print's too small, but the bottom line is we could look at patterns in both distribution uh, in the environment, across taxa, and as well as what genes they fell next to with um, proposed kind of regulatory mechanisms. And here's just one example of one of these small RNAs uh, that we found in these groups. This is one has a um, particular uh, uh, secondary structure. And a lot of times what happens in these is that the, the loops and these stem loop structures interact with regulatory regions in other genes. And in this particular case, this is group four. And so this is the most abundant group here uh, some instances of those particular group four small RNAs had a sequence right here um, that had a 32 base uh, exact match uh, uh, with the, the translation initiation site in the particular protein that it was adjacent to. And so this is really strong evidence and even some evidence for what the, the functional interaction might, have, might be for um, uh, uh, regulating the translation of this particular transcript right here. So one can play these sorts of games, and this is not really where we're headed, although I, I think for uh, folks that are interested in small RNA, this is a wonderful discovery tool um, that can take you uh, beyond just what's in genome databases or, or maybe in, in your Petri plate. And I know that people are actively pursuing this uh, sort of discovery uh, mechanism for small RNAs. And just to cap that off, I want, uh, you know, there were some, some trends that we saw uh, um, and the majority of those mystery RNAs do indeed appear to be uh, regulatory or other sorts of small RNAs. Uh, um, they can vary with depths and taxa. Uh, um, and I won't get into the rest of these details, but the bottom line is it's, uh, we ran into this really not expecting to see it, but, but think it's quite useful uh, for those folks that are interested in this class of molecules and how they regulate uh, in different taxa and populations. So that's just developing that technique, um, and it took a while, and we ran into some bumps in the road we didn't expect, but as things have progressed along, we can begin to think about how we might use looking at <coughs> transcriptomes in microbial communities to really get at uh, what they're doing out in the environment. And I'm going to tell just one story, I think, uh, again, trying to look in particular time and space domains that can tell us about what organisms are doing. And one of the things that is really hard to get at, and that I think we're still just really learning about, is population biology in wild populations of microorganisms. It turns out there aren't many clones out in nature. What there are in any given place are populations of organisms that are sometimes, you know, the same thing almost, except that if you look at their DNA, they vary as much as 90% similarity. So there's quite a bit of genetic heterogeneity within natural microbial populations that uh, needs to be interpreted, uh, as well as how these organisms interact. So what I'd like to talk about here 
is just one example of looking into these microbial populations in a more dynamic sense. And we used a robot, my colleague at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Institute, Chris Sholin, developed a way with this robot to basically sample automatically in the marine environment. And teaming up with him, we developed a way to fix microbial cells that were sampled to preserve their RNAs. And I'm going to skip through the validation of this technique uh, because it'll take too long. But the bottom line is we can use this robot out in the ocean to automatically sample cells, fix them for downstream transcriptome analysis, and see what's going on in the environment in a dynamic sense. And so here's a picture of this device uh, floating in Monterey Bay. And what we decided we wanted to do was to look at a day in the life of marine picoplankton. How does gene, how does gene transcription change in multiple species within a population over the course of a couple days? Because really, we've never looked at a window of time like that in wild organisms out in the environment. Um, so you know, this involves oceanography, so it's a really weird marriage of, you know, this ultra-reductionist, let's look at gene expression and do a lot of DNA sequencing, but first we have to throw this gigantic monster into the ocean to allow us to do our sampling. It's, it's kind of a weird interface, but it works. And what we did was deploy that device, and we let it drift, and here's the notion. You know, if you put a device like that in the ocean, the currents are passing by, you're looking at basically the microbial superhighway flowing past your measuring device. We wanted to float along with the microbial population and measure what was going on over time. So what we see here is that device over the course of four days following a batch of water and presumably microbial populations and sampling them every two hours along the way. So um, this is just an example of how the communities were similar at each of the different time points as we did the sampling over time. And what I can tell you is they really were pretty simple, similar. Most of the variants that we saw had to do with re relative abundance of the microbes. So if you take a look at the transcripts, uh, there was actually pretty good abundance of transcripts from a bunch of different groups that we care about in plankton. Uh, marine eukaryotes like Austriococcus, uh, the cyanobacteria, uh, which are both photoautotrophic organisms, but one's a eukaryote, one's a prokaryote, and then some really important heterotrophs, all in these same samples, taken every two hours over the course of, the, uh, in this case, I'm showing you 48 hours. Um, so we wanted, again, we have a built-in control, because we can predict what photoautotrophs should do over the course of a day, because it turns out that if you're using sunlight for energy and fixing CO2, you want to orchestrate your gene expression very carefully so the right genes are turned on at the right time. When it gets light and dark, different genes turn off, different genes turn on, and we know this well from laboratory studies. The question is, what happens in the field if you look at these two organisms and try and follow their gene expression? Well, one, one really uh, pleasing result was when we kind of asked that question very specifically by using what's called harmonic regression, that's basically for every gene saying, okay, I'm going to force a 24-hour period. You can pick any time you want to start in that period, but it's got to be 24 hours. Does this gene expression match that? And in cyanobacteria, it turns out there's clock genes that actually control that diol cycling. And if you look at the clock genes, the chi genes, in that wild population of cyanobacteria, lo and behold, what you see here, here's the dark, here's the light over time. This is photosynthetically available radiation. You see these wonderful sine waves, which are basically an indicator of the diol rhythms of these wild populations out, uh, that we sampled with this robot. And if you look at Austriococcus, you see similar things in, in sometimes uh, uh, homologous genes. Uh, um, and you can map that sort of gene expression in terms of peak expression time amongst many important metabolic pathways. So each of these circles represents a different gene in a particular pathway. And you can see the orchestration uh, over the course of a day and over the course of 48 hours of this diel rhythmic expression. Again, you know, this is not a great revelation. This is actually what we predict from the laboratory. But it's pleasing to see that our data are sufficient in terms of depth and accuracy to pull out these patterns of diel expression from these wild populations. In fact, you can compare what people have observed in lab microarrays of Austriococcus uh, in terms of peak expression time over 24 hours. Each of these dots is an individual gene in the genome. 
uh, versus what we saw in the field with our Austriacoccus populations. And this is, it almost doesn't look like ecology uh, because the, the correlation is so f amazing. So for very robust gene regulatory cycles, genome-wide we can recapture some of those patterns out in nature. And then, of course, the question is, is what, what, can we get things we don't know about? And what if it's not a 24-hour period? So we're able to develop this technique using this uh, uh, software called GeneArma, which in, uh, uses uh, an autoregressive moving average model to cluster genes that behave similarly, regardless if it's a 24-hour pattern or another pattern. So these gray things you see here are just individual genes from Austriacoccus that behave the same way in terms of their cycling. Uh, and you can look at those patterns and see if you can recreate what we predict from uh, uh, diet cycling. And so here are those clusters predicted by Gene Arma. We just give them a number, cluster 16, cluster 12. It's a collection of genes that behave the same way. In this case, the peak expression time, cluster 16, is uh, between uh, 2 p.m. and 10 p.m. and so on. And, but look at this pattern, what you see here again, it's this rhythmic cycle. This is a 24-hour mark here. Uh, and it just repeats itself day after day with all the collections of genes in these different clusters. Again, a recapitulation, but think of if it's another organism that's not a phototroph, we just can ask the question, well, what's going on at 10 a.m.? And if you look in Austriacoccus, it's what we predict. The lights are on, the sun is up. These are all the genes involved in uh, 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 the Calvin cycle for CO2 fixation, as well as synthesis of all the photosystem genes for photosynthesizing. Now, I should finish up soon, but I just want to tell you that now we're able, having verified this, to look for patterns in organisms where we don't know what to expect. And one of the most abundant heterotrophs is Pelagibacter, um, which doesn't exhibit a diel cycle. But what it does exhibit is correlations and anticorrelations between clusters of genes across the genome that I can't tell you what's going on here with respect to what was the environmental signal that caused all these genes to turn on and these genes to turn off. But what I can tell you is if you do statistical analysis and anticorrelation, and what these are is really regulons flipping switches and going on and off in response to something in the environment that we need to figure out yet. But at least we can take a look at these patterns. And we can see what genes are in those anticorrelated gene clusters. And what's interesting is, is genes that we would predict to be involved with growth, uh, both for oxidative phosphorylation and most all of the ribosomal proteins are firing off at certain times, almost seems like a burst of growth. And then when those are turned off, it turns out a lot of the genes for transport of solutes from the environment are turning on. So we're pursuing this now, and it's looking pretty interesting because the switch mechanism seems to be pretty robust and is telling us something about what's going on in the environment. What I like to say about this is that the bugs or the biosensors were really not very good at measuring chemical changes, very fine ones in the environment but that the bugs are better than us. This just shows you in another sort of analysis principle components the, the uh, uh, anti-correlation, if you will, and the signals that you get which correlate the ribosome and oxidative phosphorylation synthesis, if you will, and the, the, the transporter signal. Um, so we've got this going on, and I don't want to uh, 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 belabor it too much because I should finish up, but we're pretty excited because we're seeing patterns not just in one organism, but in collection of organisms. So here's an ar archaeon that was in this same sample. And it's not showing the same patterns in SAR-11. In fact, it has very few genes that change uh, over time in this 48-hour cycle. So there's different patterns in different organisms, and they're responding to different things in the environment. Um, so where we're headed with this, or where we'd like to head, is to understand these patterns of differential regulation in different sorts of microorganisms coexisting in the same communities, if you will, and translate that into the kinds of interactions that happen between organisms and between environments. And we have a long ways to go um, because it's a very complex system and we really, in, in the end, have to worry about not just the microbes, but all the other organisms they're interacting with. They're being preyed upon constantly and their predators are also being preyed on, working their way up the food chain. So we have a lot to, to, to understand yet, but the, the dream is that eventually we can pull out patterns in these sorts of cluster analyses, uh, but the reality is it is still a dream, and we're more like about here uh, in terms of really pulling pattern out. But we're getting closer. 
Uh, so I think I'll finish up. I'd like to thank all the folks that have worked with me over the years. Uh, it would take too long to go through all the names, uh, but some of them are listed here. Elizabeth Otteson has done a lot of the work with the um, robotic sampling and transcriptomics and so on, as well as the folks that have uh, funded us and allowed us to pursue this work. So I want to thank you all again for uh, the great honor of being able to give the store lectures, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes, Scott. So, so with the cyanobacteria linked to the diol cycle, it implies that they're, that they're synchronous, essentially. So the cell cycle is linked to the dion cycle with gene expression? Yes. Is, would that be the implication for plagiobacter, or are they just, as a population, responding to some environmental cue all at the same time? Well, so th this is, you just raise a great point, because it's not Can a you good, repeat the question? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it if that's okay. Sure. Um, Scott's really asking, you know, so we saw this pattern of gene expression in this pelagibacter organism. And um, is it really, should we even expect the whole population to be behaving in the same way at the same time? A priori, I'd say no. It's actually a good point. The fact that we're seeing a signal suggests that there's a global average across that pelagibacter population that they are basically acting more or less in tandem, even though we know that in individual cells, you know, there's not necessarily synchrony. Now, what I should say is our time resolution isn't that great. We've got about four, these are four hour time points. And so given the, the time average uh, across the population that we're looking at, they look like they're all behaving synchronously. It's probably, that's not really true necessarily, but for the level of temporal resolution we have, they effectively are. And what's interesting about that is this particular population is, yeah, we interpret it as response to something in the environment and everybody's voting the same way. Um, w another element of that, Scott, is when you do this kind of stuff, you have to worry about, well, how many populations do you have? And, you know, these are not totally pure populations, but what we did, um, I might be able to show you if I can find it quick enough. I don't want to, yeah, let's look at Pelagibacter. Ooh, that's kind of hard to see, but I'll, I'll point it out anyway. What we do is look at a single copy gene. So we looked at proteorhodopsin and pelagibacter and, and made a phylogenetic tree of all the proteorhodopsins we saw across all the time points. And there's probably evidence for the red is hot, so that would be 100%. And towards the end of the experiment, uh, almost 100% of the population looked like one genotype based on the type of proteorhodopsin. But there's another population at the beginning. So not only are we averaging across many cells within a population, but in this case, it's a couple populations. If we had deeper sequencing depth, we could um, look at these separately, potentially if we could separate them, but it's a very difficult thing to do. So you just identified a real caveat to what's going on here. If you have really uh, multiple uh, populations in a particular group, then you're it's a much more complicated uh, uh, analysis, and you just have to average them. So. Yeah? Um, have you taken your uh, marine sample machine to what would you sort of consider a recently damaged marine environment, something that suffered an oil spill or something recently, to see what genes might be turned on in it, a compromised environment? Yeah, you know, that's where this stuff needs to head. I should tell you. Um, this device is actually called, uh, Chris Sholin at Ambari developed it, it's called the Environmental Sample Processor. And the motivation for even building it was to look for, at harmful algal bloom, blooms to get kind of an early warning uh, of when blooms were forming. This device actually does onboard uh, hybridizations and detection, and then it can actually detect harmful algae and then radio telomer the, the answer back to shore. So it's a, it does a lot more sophisticated things than I talked about. We, since we want to look at a lot of genes across the community, we just sample. But the device has capabilities for onboard PCR and a number of other uh, in situ detection technologies that even allow uh, uh, real time response with respect to what organisms are there and that sort of thing. So that kind of application uh, is not science fiction. It's pretty, pretty close. <laughs>
Yeah. I was wondering if there are any surprises uh, in your time course data of uh, lots of transients being present from organisms that are actually pretty low abundance in your sample, or whether if you sort of the most abundant transcripts tended to come from your sort of dominant organisms based on, on DNA. Thanks for that question, Lizzie. It's almost like I asked you to ask that. <laughs> it's a great question, and, and we do see that, and others have seen that too. So that the level of transcripts we see doesn't necessarily also correlate directly with the level of organisms they come from. It turns out that some organisms, like Alteromonas, that are rapid responders, have disproportionately high transcript levels relative to cell numbers, and that's because um, of, of their lifestyle. Um, some organisms are out there and not really uh, um, getting bursting growth all the time and growing really fast and they have more um, monotominous total transcript levels. But organisms that are rapid responders and, and have quick exponential phase to large numbers, you'll see disproportionate levels of transcripts. And in, in a way, it's almost an indicator of lifestyle, potentially. We have time for one more. I haven't heard you worrying too much about lateral gene transfer, and this is another big revelation that comes out of the big sequencing, sure. that we need to be considering actually sort of populations that transcend species and maybe even archaea to bacteria. But is there such a thing as a discrete population? I, yeah, it's a great question, Richard. I, my opinion is, yeah, there are discrete populations, but they're a moving target as well. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of time, so and this is a point I like to make about lateral gene transfer. DNA is flying all around, all over the place. It actually doesn't matter until it's fixed in the genome. And so the process of fixation and selection of genes that are transferred is, is, has some kinetic property to it. So it, at the level that we're looking at here, um, I don't think it's an issue. But with respect to how, how, um, what you call a population today, uh, what is it next month, then that becomes a super relevant question because we know that, that genomes are plastic and these island regions in particular are ones that we can't map very well using our techniques because they're different in everything. And they're not, the, the islands that are found out in nature are not necessarily the islands that we have in our reference genomes. So it's a, that's a, just another layer of, of complexity and we do worry about it but um, I think what we do is do what we can first and then take it to that next level later. It's certainly one of the more important elements in uh, adaptation uh, and expansion into new niche space. So something to worry about. So I'd like um, for us all to thank uh, Ed DeLong for two fantastic lectures uh, and uh, really illuminating an entire area of uh, research that, um, that has tremendous potential uh, for really understanding how, how the oceans are working how, and how our entire planet depends on the underpinnings of the microbial uh, biosphere. So uh, speaking about moving into new niches, as I had said before, uh, you are all welcome to join us at a new niche, which is uh, only a few steps from here in the courtyard of life sciences uh, to celebrate Ed receiving the uh, outstanding alum award in the College of Biological Sciences. So let us take a, a minute here again and thank uh, Ed for the two fantastic days he spent with us at UC Davis. Thanks. <laughs>